I'm Ashok Angadine. I'm a professor of philosophy and chair of philosophy at Haverford College, founded by the Quakers. It's one of the top colleges in the country outside of Philadelphia. And I've been there for 40 years teaching philosophy, arriving there as a logician, teaching logic and ontology, the science of reality, but then going to India for the first time uh, after three years and discovering a whole new world of philosophy that was in my heritage, but I hadn't been there since I grew up in the West. Uh, born in Trinidad, living in Jamaica, coming to New York as a boy, getting my doctorate at Brandeis University. And so in 1968, I came to Haverford College, and I've been there ever since, I'm trying to pioneer the area of what I'd call global philosophy, opening up a global lens and a global mind for our time in the 21st century, living in a global age, where it's time really to bring our worlds together. And when I arrived at Haverford 40 years ago as a young philosopher, I realized we didn't know how to cross worlds. How do I go, if I'm raised in the Judeo-Christian Judeo world, to go into the Hindu mind, or the, the, the mind of the, the Confucian thinking, or the Chinese mind of Lao Tzu, or the African ways of thought, or indigenous uh, ways of thinking, such as the world of the Lakota? Uh, we didn't know our way. And yet I, I knew instinctively that was a key to our future. And after 40 years, it's, we've arrived at that point in the 21st century. The Global Dialogue Institute was founded about 15 years ago and it came out of years of research because I realized that we needed to have institutions that would focus the attention of educators, civic leaders, uh, religious leaders, diplomats, youth across the planet on the importance of having basically literacy and skills in understanding their different worldviews and to gain a uh, knowledge of how to understand crossing worlds so if we're in the Judeo-Christian world and culture, what would it mean to enter the Hindu mind or the Buddhist way of thinking and so forth? So the global dialogue, those words are very important. Global here means across worlds, across worldviews, religions, traditions, disciplines, ideologies, uh, different mental ecologies. How can we cross them? How do we recognize them? And can we really have dialogue across worlds? So the Institute, the Global Dialogue Institute, uh, through my work, develop what I, we call deep dialogue to distinguish what ordinarily people call dialogue. Because when we call, we say we're in dialogue and say, I'm a Christian speaking to a Muslim, but I'm interpreting them through my lens as a Christian, and we think we're talking, so it's dialogue. That's not dialogue. Dialogue requires not monologue, is when we interpret the other through our lens. And we don't realize that's a kind of violence. Because the other person is speaking from a different worldview a different reality. And if I'm interpreting them through my lens, I'm violating their otherness. So the basic ethos of dialogue is requiring us to become aware that I have a lens, or a complex lens. Most of us have many worldviews. We don't even realize we're living in multiple worlds, and I've not yet been able to even dialogue within myself across those worlds. So global dialogue is really recognizing that across worlds and worldviews. That's the word global. I know global, mean, global means many things right now, global economy and a global village, but really from a philosophical point of view uh, that of our institute, global means bringing and recognizing different worldviews. And we're in a global village, uh, and America is a global uh, culture in the sense of multicultural. We're a multicultural society, and those are worldviews. So global dialogue is a bringing to the radar, to front and center. How is it possible, is it possible, to cross worldviews and communicate truly and deeply across worlds? And so my institute, Global Dialogue Institute, has really developed uh, into a fine point what we call deep dialogue, which requires each participant to realize, let me check out my lens, and to realize that if I simply interpret the other through my lens, uncritically, I could be violating them, so how do I step back, step back from my lens, dilate my mind and heart a bit to open space, to move into the world of the other, to see it from their point of view? And if we can do that, there's a dilation of my consciousness, which I call opening the global mind, the global lens, in which now I begin to become more capacitated to see alternative worlds at one moment. When that happens, I'm in a deeper place. I'm in a deeper process. I'm entering the global world. And that's what our, our institute is attempting, to help people across the planet gain skills and literacy in global dialogue. It's no surprising that someone like David Bohm, who's a frontier uh, physicist, is looking into the implicate order and understanding the unified field, uh, where a, a Buddhist, for example, know 
in global wisdom that if reality is a unified field, then everything is interconnected and dynamic. Once you've got that, then dialogue follows. So Bohm dialogue is a natural follow through of, of this insight that reality is a dynamic interconnected field because it implies dialogue immediately. So there are many forms of dialogue, by the way, and what I call deep dialogue is a, is a generic name for the many different art forms that uh, are out there in the marketplace, appreciative inquiry, uh, what Scott Peck does in Seattle in terms of his form of dialogue uh, is another form, what uh, Peter Senge does and the bone people do coming out. They're all sensitive to the fact that at the very core, real dialogue requires a sensitivity to knowing the other has a different worldview and a crossing into that. So what typically happens in naive situations when people come together, they interject their agendas. They bring in their own local lens without knowing it because they've not been cultivated in the ethos, the ethics of dialogue, which is to watch yourself, be aware and mindful of what you're importing to the round table, to the sacred space, and not to uncritically thrust it upon others, right? But so when that happens, which it always does, it is in the, in the uh, silent ethos of, of, of the art form of dialogue, by whatever name you call it. And Bohm is one of the great examples, and the people who follow him is to be sensitive to that open space, opening sacred space. And, and when people would interject their ego agendas, their delicate ways of helping them to become aware of it, and to check it, and, and then correct for it. Because you really want to, people to, you want dialogue to speak to where people are. If someone is a fundamentalist, a terrorist, whatever it may be, however extreme, what you would like in the therapy of deep dialogue is to help get it on the table open it up and then deal with it. So it's not necessarily a bad thing when that happens. Humans have, uh, have rational capacities. That's what rationality is. It's a capacity to always step back somewhat from your lens, not see only the world that way, but to open up other possibilities. Right? That's critical thinking. That's, what the, that's the essence of being a human, a rational being. So that's really what it is. We have to realize that when we impose our lens on the other, we violate their otherness, whatever it may be. If I'm a male and I have a male outlook and my spouse is a, a woman with a different perspective and I'm, I'm imposing my view on her, I'm violating her otherness as a, as a woman, for example. So it's worldviews, it's human relations, it's personal, and it's the most fundamental skill in being human.